So for his YouTube series, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, Emmanuel Acho has tackled all kinds of tough topics with people from Matthew McConaughey to Chelsea Handler to police officers, the head of the NFL. Emmanuel agrees that the conversation is far from over. He's with me now. How is the conversation going, and is it a full-blown conversation yet? I feel like people don't know how to converse. Uh, <laughs> well, the holiday season makes it tougher because now you're talking to your relatives who may be stuck in their old ways, their old trains of thought. So I think everybody's really on pins and needles around this holiday season, but the conversation has been progressing. It's moved really uh, from verbal communication to the book, uh, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, the book, which came out about a month ago now. And I think people are really reading and digesting and are now being saturated and, and equipped with tools over the course of this holiday season. Let's talk about your fellow uh, UT alum, Matthew McConaughey, uh, who, with, with whom you kind of broke this series on Instagram. He was a big reason why this thing broke through. Getting yeah. him to sit down and talk was pretty cool. McConaughey recently went out and said there's some problems with the left, this, this sort of elitism, this condescension, this criticism of normal folk he says that he connected to, meaning he's from Texas and simple normal folk who drive a truck doesn't necessarily mean they're a racist hating guy named Daryl. You know what I mean? I mean, and McConaughey got some flack for that. Do you back him with everything he said, part of what he said? Uh, I, I back McConaughey's intention. I don't necessarily back McConaughey's action. I know McConaughey well. He's a, he's a friend of mine, a great guy. And McConaughey wants to keep the peace. McConaughey has called me several times off the air and been like, hey, bro, like, can't we just meet in the middle here? Can't we just meet in the middle there? Not specifically him and I meeting in the middle, but talking about the world at large. And I'm like, nah, Matthew, it doesn't necessarily work like that. Like, there are some issues that there isn't a middle ground that we can find. And so I fully back McConaughey's intention because McConaughey's intention is all about unity, peace, coming together. Um, yeah. But I think at times his peaceful intentions, um, the, the actions or the words that are said, they do undermine um, the, the intent at times. All right, give me some issue. Give me a spot where we cannot meet in the middle. I'll give you a spot, you know, and it's in joking form. I, I saw this Instagram meme going around uh, and, and it was like two girls discussing like, hey, can't we just disagree? And one of the girls responded like, yes, we can disagree about our pizza toppings, not about racism. And, and, and obviously that's not necessarily and not at all what McConaughey was alluding to, but there are some things where there isn't just a, hey, let's meet in the middle, right? If, if you're talking about racism, if you're talking about sexism, if you're talking about misogyny, if you're talking about things like that, you can't just meet in the middle. And I think where um, uh, home, where heterosexual white males can fall into a trap is in that most things in America and decisions don't adversely affect them. Like when you're talking racism, when you're talking sexism, that doesn't adversely affect uh, the white heterosexual male. And so they can often speak as far as, hey, let's just keep the peace, but keeping the peace doesn't benefit people that are oppressed. Keeping the peace only benefits those who are not oppressed. Is the way to make change to have white heterosexual males say, okay, or can they say, well, wait a minute, we want to be part of the conversation, and part of the conversation sometimes is figuring out things by asking questions that may come off as, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you know, I, I judge the way you think. I judge the way you believe. I sort of believe that the conversation in general still needs to happen. I, I think there's a lot of fear and people are quiet and they're swallowing things and they're not saying things because they just want to get by and not get fired. I don't think the way to uh, make change is through just passive aggressive acceptance from white males, black males, white females, black females, anybody of the sort. I think it happens through uncomfortable dialogue. That's why I've had the conversations. Billy, I'll put it like this. The only way we can really grow is if we challenge our own ideologies and challenge other ideologies to get to an optimal way of thinking. But the, the, the operative word there is challenge. 
We can't just passively accept the status quo as the status quo, particularly when we now realize our country may have been founded upon certain things that we would not accept if we tried to found them founded in the same way today. Let's talk about cancel culture for a second. You know, there's a million examples of it. But how do we get to a place where we all acknowledge this escalating war on human flaws is unsustainable. We're all flawed as human beings. We make mistakes. We say sorry. We decide to get, we should be able, we should be accepted and move on. The canceling of people is frightening because it deepens the divide. It keeps people quiet, afraid to say the truth, and it makes just basically passive aggressive liars out of all of us. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I absolutely hate and abhor cancel culture because cancel culture does not give people the opportunity to grow, develop, evolve. I always say, imagine if those who first thought that the earth was flat and not in fact round, imagine if they were never allowed cancel. to change their opinion. <laughs> cancel them. They said the earth was flat. It's got to be flat. No, we are allowed to change our opinions, grow and evolve, particularly if our original opinions weren't intended to hurt people. Maybe it was unintended in a pain, but it wasn't intended to hurt people. I hate cancel culture, but remember, Billy, it's so much more fun in this day and age to just tell someone they're stupid, tell someone they're wrong, and never forgive them. Yes, it's just immature. It's all get out. We have to move on beyond cancel culture. What's a bigger problem in America, racism or classism? Oh, that is one of the best questions I've been asked the last six months. I will say this. Racism inherently and intrinsically feeds into classism. Those two things are interwoven and interconnected. If you talk about classism, the majority of classism was bred based upon racism. Go back to the mid 1950s because of redlining. The only way to acquire, the historical way to acquire wealth in America is through property and is through education. Well, redlining, it diminished property for black people. And if education is funded by property, well, redlining diminished property and therefore also diminished education. Historically, Billy, the only ways to acquire wealth, property and education. So classism has been affected by racism. So imagine if one bucket of water was pouring into another bucket of water. The bucket of water at the bottom is classism, but the bucket of water that is pouring into classism is racism. So it's Woo! interwoven. It's very tricky to answer that question. Um, but Because I the middle class, we're a country built on the middle class. The middle class built this country. It's a dead thing now. I mean, you've got more people earning more money at the very top. It's the, it, it, you wouldn't believe this whole idea of, of, of blue collar is, is fading in front of our eyes. It's a disintegration within family. I mean, how do we get into communities and fix that? How do we fix the, the inequality financially for everybody? Uh, I think for me, it, if, if you were to give me one answer, I would say it would start with education. Now, education is yeah. not so simple. There also has to be branding around education. Education has to become cool again in so many of these com communities. Emmanuel Acha wanted to play in the NFL when I was a kid because that was cool. It was cool for a black man to be in the NFL. I didn't necessarily know a ton of black people when I were growing up that were CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. That wasn't like cool. Right. When it was, hey, what do you want to be when you when it was um, on Halloween or whatever the case may be? And you dress like who you wanted to be when you grew up. I wore an Emmett Smith jersey, Hall of Fame running back for the Dallas Cowboys. I didn't come with like a stethoscope around my neck and, uh, and, 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 and scrubs on. Now, that may have just been me, but I think we need to put a bigger uh, focus on education and even rebranding education within so many of our communities. How does it feel for you? like to be this, you know, ex NFL player who has this incredible brain and all these feelings and to have worked it out and being known for it now and not just, you know, tackling other dudes on a field, but for sharing real thoughts and having people follow you and ask you questions and engage your mind. And I mean, it must must feel very satisfactory, I would think. Good. It's very it's very humbling. Um, and there's a lot of pressure. Um, it's very humbling because to, to be put in this situation, Millie, with so many people 
listening and leaning on my words. It's a very humbling feeling. But simultaneously, it's a lot of pressure because the who much is given much is required. And because so many people are now listening to me, uh, it is my dutiful responsibility to say the right thing. So it's both and we humbling know, and it's pressure. And back to cancel culture, we know at some point there are also people listening. Wait, wait, wait. What did he say? Hold on. Back that tape up. Exactly. What did he, exactly. Right? <laughs> so there must be a little bit of like trepidation, a little fear that you, know, that you have too because it's like, oh, gosh. There's a bad apple spoiler somewhere. Absolutely. I calculate every word and every syllable that I say. <laughs> You're a man who's benefited greatly. Your voice is the true you. Has, we've gotten to know that because of social media. So uh, your answer might be, you know, tilted in that way, but take that out of it. And do you think social media is mostly good or mostly bad? <laughs> man. Great question. Um, golly. Uh, okay. You can't say bad. mostly either, <laughs> right? Social media, social media has a lot of bad, terrible bad, but it also has a lot of good. To your point, some of my closest friends I initially met on social media. I've connected with the likes of so many people. Matthew McConaughey, Oprah, uh, Roger Goodell, because of social media. So I am yeah. very hard pressed to say that social media does more bad than it does good, but I'm not so ignorant as to uh, not acknowledge the bad of social media. Okay, we hear the term cultural appropriation. And right, to you, what's the biggest problem, you know, under that heading right now? It's twofold, and um, I'll try not to get into such of the weeds of this, but cultural appropriation, the parallel I draw in my book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, is this. It's complimentary when you borrow someone else's work and cite your sources. Remember, we all wrote papers in middle school, high school, and in college where, please, you can steal an excerpt from someone else's book. Just make sure, Billy, you cite your sources. What happens when you don't cite your sources? You're immediately expelled or suspended when you take something from someone else and you don't lend the credit to the original author. Cultural appropriation, I draw that parallel. For so long, all this talk black culture, black women um, were mocked because of their, their, their lips, called gorillas, called monkeys, because of their waist and their hips. But now, lip injections, butt injections are to be praised in society and not because black people started to do them, but because white people started to do them. So if you talk about cultural appropriation, there is a long history involved of pain and of hurt, black people being mocked for something that white people are being praised for. But if you wanted to very simply understand cultural appropriation, I draw the parallel to not citing your sources back when you used to write papers. Oh, man, I could uncomfortably conversate with you for a very long time, but... Uh... This is extra, like the, you know, I mean, I'm gonna have to push for an eight part series, which adds up to 16 minutes. Uh, <laughs> hey dude, thank you so much. Congratulations on your book. What's next for you? Book two? Man, what is next? Working on Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, made the New York Times bestsellers list by the grace of God week one, working on Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Boy, a uh, young adaptation. Yeah. Uh, of uncomfortable conversations with a black man. So the conversation, sir, they will continue. Good for you, man. Good for you. Uh, thank you, my friend. Good seeing you. Likewise, brother. Until next time. Thank you for watching. If you want more extra, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you'll never miss a video.